thank you for being with us, Michael James. Okay, uh, born in Germany, Chris Strakowitz came to the United States after World War II. He developed a love for roots and blues music and in 1960 established the indie record label Arhuli. He traveled to plantations and prisons, roadhouses and whorehouses, churches and bio juke joints and returned with recordings that would revolutionize the sound of popular music. Strakowitz brought performers such as bluesman Mance Lipscomb and Lightning Hopkins, Tejano musicians, uh, or Norteño musicians, Flaco Jimenez and Lydia Mendoza, Cajun greats Michael Doucette and the Savoy family, and Zydeco King Clifton Chenier, into national and world prominence. Maureen Gosling and Chris Simon produced and directed this Ain't No Mouse Music, and we'll be finding out what well, mouse music is in just a minute, which tells the amazing story of Chris Strockwitz and Arhuli Records. Released in 2013, the film premiered at this year's South by Southwest Film Festival. Jeffrey St. Clair, St. Clair called the film a vivid portrait of an obsessive sonic sleuth in which the filmmakers take a hip-shaking stroll from New Orleans to Appalachia and right into the very DNA of rock and roll. Uh, in this beautifully shot film, we come back we come face to face with the creators of indigenous music. Maureen Gosling, who lived in Austin in the 70s, uh, has been a documentary filmmaker for more than 30 years. Her work is often focused on themes of people and their cultural values, music as cultural expression, and the changing gender roles of men and women. Chris Simon uh, has been an award-winning documentary filmmaker uh, for more than 25 years, producing independent documentaries through her Sageland Media. Gosling and Simon met while working with acclaimed documentary filmmaker Les Blank, with whom they collaborated on classic films such as Gat Tooth Women and Burden of Dreams. And I would also mention that Chris Strockwich collaborated with, like we have a, Les Blank is like a, <laughs> a pulling together uh, is, a, is a central figure in all of this because uh, Chris and Les Blank work together on stuff. Okay, uh, Chris Strockwich, Count Strockwich. <laughs> you, came, uh, you came to uh, the United States in 1947 after World War II because uh, the, uh, you said the Russians were shooting all the capitalists. <laughs> it's not quite that simple, but uh, thanks for having me on the coop here. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, it doesn't count here anyway to be a count over there. But, uh, I fell in love, as you mentioned, uh, with all these different regional musics, not just with uh, blues at first, actually New Orleans jazz was my very first love, and I heard hillbilly music. It was just this amazing array of extraordinarily powerful and emotional music. All of it was very rhythmic, I think, and so much of it was really dance music, not in the contemporary sense of the word, where you just, you know, beep, 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 and people just hop around, but uh, couple dancing, which was really the uh, thing I'll just tell you a little brief story about when Flaco Jimenez went first to play just north of here, his first gig for, for gringos, uh, he came back and I asked him, hey, Flaco, how did it go? He said, man, it was all right, but man, those people dance like kangaroos. They hop all <laughs> over the goddamn place. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, I, I love the fact... Okay, well, one, for one thing, you, it, this, and you guys, it's, it's like a detective movie. Uh, and it's wonderful the way you sort of move. You first, I guess, Lightning Hopkins was what inspired you to come. You went to Houston looking for what, sort of tracking down Lightning Hopkins. And then that led you to Mance Lipscomb, who you recorded, I guess, was the first artist you recorded. And I, I, I it's thrilling to me because I had the honor uh, and sheer delight of watching both Lightning Hopkins and sort of not knowing them, but having contact with Lightning Hopkins and Mance Lipscomb uh, back and what amazing performers they were. Uh, so I, but I, so I'm, we're going to go back and forth here because the film tells your story and in a, I think, a beautiful way. I think it's, it, the film works on so many different levels. I mean, I, I just loved it. Uh, it works as a historical document. It works as a, as a sort of a personality uh, it communicates you, for communities, Chris Strockwitz in a terrific way. And the music, the music is just wonderful. I mean, it's just, if you just watched it for the music, it's, it's an absolute delight. So how did you guys, how did you start conceiving this, to, putting it together? Well, I mean, for us, there's a certain element of home movies. This was our life. We've been intimate in Chris's circle for 30 years. And... Um, so it was obvious. We both kind of had the idea at the same time. And Maureen 
broached it to Mr. Chris. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then a while later, you want to continue, Maureen? Yeah, I caught him in the nick of time. I, uh, I talked to him on the phone one day, and he said, oh, there are these people from PBS that, that <laughs> want to do a film about me, and I'm supposed to sign a contract with them next week, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, Chris, Chris, don't you remember? Chris Simon and I asked to make a film about you a year ago, and you said no. And, and he said, you did? Ooh, oh, oh. <laughs> he says, well, uh, so he thought about it for, I don't know if it, it was a few minutes or a day, but he decided not to sign the contract with these people, and we're very glad that he didn't because we jumped into it, and, and it, even though it took a long time, we had an amazing experience being in his world even more and hanging around with him and going on the road with him and, and uh, meet, you know, s being able to be with all these people that, all these musicians that we, n many of the, whom we knew and then of course others that we didn't know. Right, right. Uh, Chris? So I also think, um, you know, one of the, even though we knew the people usually, we saw a whole other side of, Chris and a whole other side of the music that he loves. I mean, the passion that bring, that Chris brings to his work is extraordinary. I mean, just from going around, knocking on strangers' doors, saying, oh, do you know where this person lives? I mean, it's, it's inspiring. And I hope that that's one of the things that young people get out of the film, that if you have a vision, just do it. Okay, I think we need to talk semantics here for a minute. Uh, the, we need to find out what mouse music is, and also how I think the wonderful story about how Arhuli uh, got its name. So first, I think we actually have a clip, don't we, Tracy, about mouse music from the films. We're gonna get this good. I think like you're headed way above them, you know? My stuff isn't produced. I just catch it as it is. Chris would be one of the pioneers in producing, selling, promoting vernacular music. For him, authentic music was down home, deep-rooted, of the people that came from within. What people love about America is the culture. That they love Hollywood and they love the music. And so much of the music that people love around the world came from these rural communities in America, especially in the south of America. And if it wasn't for people like Chris going down and recording this stuff, we wouldn't know about it. And in some cases, it might have just disappeared out of cultural history. Didn't miss my love one until she had gone. I don't know why I like it so much. It's just got some guts to it. It ain't wimpy, that's for sure. <laughs> it ain't no mouse okay, music. Right. <laughs> this ain't no mouse music. Uh, a film by, um, by uh, Maureen Gosling and Chris Simon uh, about the work of Chris Strockwitz and Arhuli Records. Uh, Chris, they, I know you, you worked with Mac McCormick uh, in Houston, and I think, was he the one who came up with the name for Arhuli? Yeah, well, it was Mac McCormick, really, that I was really happy to meet because he really knew Texas better, the vernacular Texas, than any other human being, I think, as well as he knew all about politics. But anyway, he was a, he's, a, he's a treasure of his own. And, uh, but uh, anyway, yes, he did come up with the name uh, of Arhuli after we had recorded uh, Mans Lipscomb, you know, because... Uh, we both thought this was an amazing person who had the entire culture, uh, musical culture of a rural African American in his head from the 20s up to the present. And um, Max said, you know, what uh, Lead Belly was for Alan Lomax uh, was, I think, Mans Lipscomb is going to be for Arhuli. You should put this out as a first record. And then I thought about labels like maybe a name like Southern or or, or Brazos, or 
<laughs> humidity or something like that. <laughs> and he suddenly said, how about our Huli? And I said, our what? <laughs> and uh, But then he told me it appeared on the Library of Congress record where they interviewed a uh, performer they just recorded and asked him what he called the song he just did. And he apparently said, that's an ara, 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 huli. And underneath it, it said a field holler. You see, when they used to just sing out in the fields, you know, oh, another man and gone, another man and gone. You know, just when they were picking cotton and so on. And then I figured, well, hell, it's a catchy name, and I said, well, what the heck, I'll just knock out one of the H's, I think, in there. <laughs> and uh, that's how it happened. And I have heard, encountered, if you ever knew Fred McDowell, for example, or somebody from Mississippi, when they were a little bit on the nervous side, Fred always would start with, look, look at here, Chris, are, are, are we going to do this? Or, <laughs> you know, they sort of stutter the aura a lot. Yeah. And I think that's what this man did, but the academics wrote it down as A-R-H-O-O-L-I-E-O. -O -O. There was another W in there, I forgot. Anyway, it stuck. <laughs> So Arhuli it was. <laughs> okay, and 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 Arhuli was. I mean, it sort of changed the face of. I mean, it it was not. I guess it was jo Country Joe and Fixin' to Die Rag that that you that helped you to get it, that financed it, right? Well, in a, to a certain degree, yes. Uh, Ed Densen, who was his manager, suddenly came up to me. No, he called me up one night and said, "Do you have your tape machine ready? You know, we need to record this song for this big." anti-Vietnam protest march that's coming up. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm just leaving tomorrow morning for Houston to meet up with Lightning to go to Europe. Anyway, okay, so I told him, go ahead and bring him over. This Motley crew comes over. And they did the song, <laughs> one, two, three, what are we fighting for? Next stop is Vietnam, you know. I thought it was kind of a funny song, but it had very heavy lyrics to it. And I had learned from a guy in Louisiana about uh, getting their copyrights. I can tell it's another story. But anyway, <laughs> when they walked out, when Joe and the gang walked out of my house, uh, he asked me, you know, what do I owe you for the tape, Chris? I said, you don't owe me nothing for the tape, but how about a publisher? Do you have a publisher for the song? In case it gets played on the air, you know, BMI would collect some money for him. He said, no, go ahead. But it was an oral agreement. And he resented it later on, you know, for quite some time. But about 20 years ago, I actually gave it back to him. But we did make money. The first big check for $70,000 came in after the Woodstock movie came out and the Woodstock soundtrack and all that. And I gave him half. And the other half I put down on my building where I'm located now. Well, for anybody who doesn't know, I think Country Joe McDonald went up on stage. Didn't somebody not show? There was a band that didn't show yeah. or something, and he went up on mm -hmm. stage at mm -hmm. uh, at Woodstock and sang "Fixing to Dry Rag" die rag and just blew the crowd away. And mm -hmm. it, and it was it was off and running. Yeah, it became the national anthem of the whole movement. I think. So. Yeah, yeah, which was remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, Tracy, let's take a break. Uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is Rag Radio. My guests are Chris Strockwitz, uh, Marlene Gosling, and Chris Simon. <laughs> I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is Rag Radio. <laughs> 